you know, I was thinking we need something of some uh, some content for our channel that's not so war guy related. Something that might appeal to women and, and ladies as well. Whoa, whoa, whoa! Wait a minute! Wait a minute! Wait! <laughs> what are you doing? Why did you take that off my wall? I mean, the the glass is broken twice already. What? What do you need it for? We needed a good intro. I'm Charles and I'm James. We love history and we want to share our love of history with you. As the intro the intro things show that we want to do something different so today we are going to start a trilogy of videos on Secretariat. And so fortunately we have an in-house historian on music and horses. Our sister Andrea. We need a bigger camera. Can you scooch over? Yeah. Try living with her. Today is the 149th running of the Kentucky Derby, also known as the Run for the Roses. The Derby is also the first of three very important races in American horse racing known as the Triple Crown. This year also marks the 50th anniversary of one of the greatest racehorses in American racehorsing history. And he is only one of a handful of horses to have won the Triple Crown. His name was Secretariat. It all started with a coin toss. Old Ruler was one of the top breeding stallions in the 1960s. Breeding a mare to him was exclusive. Most stallions were syndicated so that only certain people could bring mares to him to be bred. They would pay a fee to buy the right to breed their mare to the stallion. Bull Ruler was different. He was owned by Mrs. Phipps. Her son was Ogden Phipps, and he handled a lot of the arrangements when it came to breeding the horses. In order to breed a mare to Bull Ruler, the owner had to make a special deal with the Phippses. An owner would approach the Phippses with the mare to breed to Bold Ruler. If the mare was deemed acceptable, the mare would be bred to Bold Ruler for two consecutive years or until two foals were produced. They would then flip a coin and the winner would get first choice of the foals. In this way, the Phippses would be able to get new horses from good mares for their own farm. Christopher Chenery had a horse farm in Virginia. He made this deal with Ogden Phipps, only he did it a little bit differently. Oh, Starting wait a minute, in wait a minute, wait a minute. And looking at the script, um, it looks a little too complicated for the average lay person who doesn't know anything about horse racing. Including me! And? I think you need to oversimplify it a little bit. In 1968, Chenery sent two mares to Bold Ruler, Hasty Matilda and Something Royal. Both mares produced foals the following year. In 1969, Chenery again sent Something Royal to Bold Ruler, but sent a mare named Cicada instead of Hasty Matilda. Something Royal produced a foal, but Cicada didn't. When the time came to flip the coin to determine which foals each party would get, neither wanted to win. The winner got first choice of the foals born in 1969. The loser of the toss got first choice of the foals to be born in 1970. 
Because of this, the winner would only get one full, as the loser would obviously choose something royal's full over Cicada's non-existent full. The Phippses won the toss and took something royal's full, born in 1969. The Chenneries got Hasty Matilda's full from 1969, and something royal's unborn 1970 full. Well, Something Royal gave birth to Secretariat just after midnight the morning of March 30th, 1970. He was considered a large foal and he continued to grow into a big colt. He didn't have a name until late 1970. He was just a chestnut colt on the Chenery Farm. Now, naming thoroughbred racehorses is not as simple as you might think. Any other horse can be given any name that is chosen by the owner, such as Horsey McHorseface, or maybe a Poodle. How about Badly? Doesn't everybody want to enter the ring hearing their name saying Riding Badly? What's it? Houdini. I mean, any horse that escapes all the time could definitely be called Houdini. Stupid. Snoreen. Or snores. And definitely, you can't name a horse after our f our favorite mustachioed uh, dictator, uh, Joseph Saul. Now, racehorsing names, on the other hand, must be approved by the jockey club, and this can be extremely tiresome. When naming something royals full, three names were sent into the jockey club, and they were all rejected. So, another three names were sent in. The last name in the set of three was suggested by Christopher Chenery's secretary, Miss Elizabeth Ham. The name she suggested was a name that was approved by the Jockey Club, Secretariat. As Secretariat grew up on Chenery's farm, the Meadows, another cult, a year older than Secretariat, was rising to stardom. His name was Reva Ridge. The Meadows was going through a slump when it came to good racehorses. Reva Ridge gave the farm the push it needed after a dry spell of poor foals. Christopher Chenery's health was failing him during this time, and most of the operations of the horse farm was taken over by his daughter, Penny Chenery Tweedy. While Reva Ridge started his racing career in 1971, Secretariat started training. Around this time, the Meadows hired a new trainer. His name was Lucian Lauren. He had not been extremely successful as a trainer up until this point. He had never had a two-year-old colt that was good enough to send to the Kentucky Derby, which is one of the most prestigious races in America. With Reaver Ridge, however, this was now a possibility for the Canadian-born trainer. Things seemed to be looking up for everyone around the Meadows stable. Lucian hired a fellow Canadian to ride Reaver Ridge. His name was Ronnie Turcott. With him aboard, Reaver Ridge won several important two-year-old races and was pointed towards the Kentucky Derby and the Triple Crown. Wait a minute. We've been talking a lot about the Triple Crown now, but I think you should probably try to explain to the audience who are not so big into horse lore what the Triple Crown is. The Triple Crown is a series of three races that take place over a series of about five weeks. The Kentucky Derby is the first of these races. This race is always run on the first Saturday in May. So if you want to watch the Derby, turn on your TV, first Saturday of May. The second race is the Preakness Stakes. This is run two weeks after, so the third Saturday in May. The final race is the Belmont Stakes, which is also the longest of the three, and this is three weeks after the Preakness. The reason why this is such a big deal is the races are so close together. Most horses, especially now, will take several weeks in between races to recoup from the stress of that race, especially if it was a hard one, and take time to retrain, adjust things, before going on to that next race, but they are so close together, the horses barely have time to rest. So it is a, an immense honor to win the Triple Crown. Make sense? 
Yeah, I suppose that'll explain everything. All right. Well, 1972 rolled around, and Reva Ridge won the Kentucky Derby by more than three lengths. Wait, what's a length? Andrea, what's a length? You, you could have asked this before we started recording, and I could have defined this already for you. Well, you could have also thought about it. It's eight to nine feet, okay? It's about the length of a horse. Okay. So, yeah, three lengths. Things were looking hopeful for the three-year-old. But this didn't last long, though, when two weeks later, Reaver Ridge lost the Preakness Stakes. Their hopes for a Triple Crown winner were gone. Citation had been the last horse to win the Triple Crown, and that had been in 1948. At 24 years and counting, people were starting to believe that the Triple Crown couldn't be won anymore. And Reva Ridge's failure was yet another nail in that thought coffin. Reva Ridge did redeem himself a bit when he won the third leg of the Triple Crown, the Belmont Stakes, by seven lengths. Unfortunately, from then on, Reva Ridge's career started to go downhill. He lost the Hollywood Derby in California and ended the race exhausted. He raced only six more times that year and lost the last one by 38 lengths. Not a good look. All this was very understandably disappointing for Penny. Reaver Ridge was her golden boy. The horse she pinned countless hopes on. Her favorite. Secretariat's early training was not amazing. He was described as big, awkward, and didn't know what to do with himself. He did not really impress anyone at first. But as Reva Ridge ran his races in early 1972, Secretariat began drastically improving. He seemed like he was improving so well that when he raced his first race on Independence Day 1972, they thought he couldn't lose. However, things did not go as planned. Secretariat started badly, getting bumped at the start by several horses. There was little his jockey, Paul Feliciano, could do. They were boxed in, and without an opening, they were stuck. When a spot finally opened up where they could get through, they took the opportunity and just took off. Despite his best efforts, they couldn't do better than fourth place. Lucian was very mad with Feliciano at first, as he felt that Secretariat should not have lost. But after viewing the tapes of the race, he realized that Feliciano wasn't really at fault, and he did the best he could. Secretariat's second race on July 15th started out almost the same way. While he didn't get bumped like before, he broke from the starting gate last. It seemed to Feliciano that Secretariat couldn't find his stride, so Feliciano let Secretariat find it. When he did, he started to gain. He caught up and passed every horse to win by six lengths. The young colts seemed to show promise. Despite Feliciano's doing well on Secretariat's second race, Lucian wanted to put Ronnie Turcott up on Secretariat. He rode Secretariat on the Colts' third race. Again, Secretariat took time to find his stride. But just like the previous race, once he found his stride, he picked up speed and started passing his opponents. He won this race by one and a half lengths. Secretariat continued to win the next two races. However, despite his performances, there was still cause for concern. Being a bold ruler colt, his stamina would be in question. He had shown speed, but bold ruler foals tended not to do well with the longer three-year-old races, because they would run out of energy from how fast they were running. Questions of how sound he was, or, or how healthy he was, were also asked. The question of his stamina first caused Turcott to worry during Secretariat's fifth race. During this race, Turcotte had to bring Secretariat out on the outside of the field of horses. 
Now, naturally, if you've ever seen horse races, they're always hugging that rail as close as they can because the track is shorter on the rail. And so going on the outside means you have to run farther. So, yeah, you may be able to pass everyone, but it's also going to take up a lot of your horse's endurance by having to run farther. So while Secretariat did win the race by nearly two lengths, Secretariat had tired at the end of the race. This raised the question as to whether he could run a mile. Up until now, he had not run that far. It is noted in William Knack's book, Secretariat, when horses win with bursts of speed, passing horses around the turn and through the stretch, they create the sometimes mistaken impression that the longer the distance is, the better they will perform. That is not necessarily so. There are stretch running sprinters who would not have the stamina to run further than six furlongs. Secretariat's sixth race, the Champagne Stakes, on October the 14th, was both a disappointment and an encouragement. While Secretariat finished first in this race, he was disqualified to second place due to bumping another horse. While Turcotte was disappointed at this judgment against him and the Colt, he was also encouraged because Secretariat had run his best race yet. He knew that Secretariat was going to be able to run the longer distances. Secretariat astounded and amazed the crowds during his two-year-old racing season. Out of nine races, he won seven of them, losing only his first and the race he technically won but was disqualified to second place. For his astounding two-year-old season, he received the Eclipse Award for Champion Two-Year-Old Colt and the American Horse of the Year Award. The latter award was a rare honor as not many two-year-olds win it. Despite Secretariat's great two-year-old season, there was still a cloud on the horizon. Christopher Chenery's health continued to decline. With his declining health, the question and concern of the inheritance tax was on the mind of his children. While they could get money by syndicating Secretariat's breeding rights, when he was syndicated could make a big difference in his three-year-old racing season. Penny wanted to be able to race Secretariat through his three-year-old season, but if Christopher Chenry died before the end of 1972, this could become a problem. If syndicated before 1973, the syndicate members would most likely insist on breeding that following spring in 1973. So on that ominous note, well, that's going to have to be the end of the first part of Secretariat. And this video is actually going to be uploaded the day of the Kentucky Derby. So after you watch this, you can actually watch the 149th? Yes, I believe it is the 149th. Yes. So you can Too watch... Too bad it couldn't be 150th. That would be cool. But we're not that lucky, guys. Yeah, it is the 149th because it was the 99th in 73. Yep. And it's the 50th anniversary of Secretariat. Well, at least what he did that year. I mean, he's older than 50 this year. I mean, yeah, he's 53. Yeah, you, you know what I'm talking about. Yeah, well, I want to clarify, okay? So, yeah, until our next adventure, and where we continue to look at the astounding career of this guy, hey, uh, we'll see you later. Until our next adventure, farewell.